Today we're going to talk about natural logarithms and natural base e. We've talked about logarithms and we've talked about exponential notation or exponential functions, but there is um, there's a, an extra layer to this, and it's called a natural base. In a natural base, the base is actually the letter e. The e refers to um, a number. It's Euler's number. And Euler's number has an actual, it's just a number. And if I were to write that number out, I'm going to exhaust you a little, but it would be 0 0.7182818289. And it keeps going forever. It is non-terminating, non-repeating. It's called an irrational number. And we have lots of irrational numbers that you are familiar with. The most common, I believe, is pi. That's an irrational number. Another one might be, exam uh, an example might be the square root of two or the square root of 13. These again are um, irrational numbers that cannot be represented by a fraction or a terminating repeating decimal. And because it is just a number, we could take 2.71828 and raise it to the 15th power. Or we could take the logarithm base 2.71828 of 452, and we can use these functions in the exact same way we would if the um, base was a 2 or a 10. In exponential notation, what this would look like is we would have just a consistent, we would have e, and I would be raising it to the power of x, and we use the e because this number is too cumbersome to write, although you'll see me give a decimal representation of this occasionally. And in logarithms, um, we, we, we would write log, and instead of a number, because it's too big, we put an e here of x, and this just means that e raised to some power will be equal to x. This is actually so common. It's used all the time in science. It's so, called, so, so common, it's called a natural log. And like we so often do in math, we're very efficient. And so we abbreviated, or we abbreviate this by just saying um, ln. So I could do ln of x. And these two are equivalent. Math people have a tendency to come up with efficient ways of doing things. So what do these look like if we were to graph them? Well, as you would expect, because E is just a number, uh, we can identify in the natural base function we can identify the key points, the important points that we always do. In this case, when we raise that number 2.718 blah 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 to the zero power, when x equals zero, anything to the zero power is just one. And we know that when you raise something to the power of one, you get yourself or 2.72. And I'm going to abbreviate it with 2.72 for the purposes of our discussion. So what would this look like? Well, like all exponential functions, it has a horizontal asymptote. And because there's no, this is a parent function, there's no horizontal transformation on it. My horizontal asymptote is going to be, I'm going to put horizontal here. I'm going to abbreviate it. Our horizontal asymptote is just going to be at x equals zero. That hopefully is familiar. Um, because I, I, I'm going to go ahead and graph the two points um, so we can just see kind of what it looks like. It's going to be an exponential function, so it's going to have the general exponential shape that we're so accustomed to. I'm going to go up about two. I'm going to connect my two. It goes up forever, and it gets really close to my horizontal asymptote without ever actually touching it. So my domain and my range look just like they would for any other base that has no horizontal transformations. And there we go, we've graphed a natural base function. We can also graph the natural log function. And if you remember, we said that raising um, a number to an exponent is the inverse of taking the log base 
e of n. So these are I inverses. I'm going to write that here because it's important. And you might ask yourself, why important, Ms. Palmer? Well, it is important because when I go to find these um, important points, I can remember that my domain and range in inverse functions just flip. So my domain becomes my range, and my range becomes my domain. And to be honest, y'all, that is so much easier to remember than trying to figure out those individual points. With a logarithmic function, I have a vertical asymptote. And because there's no um, transformations on this guy, I think over here I said horizontal transformation, and I really should have said vertical transformation. In this one, there's no horizontal transformation. So my vertical asymptote is going to be at zero. I'm going to just write that it's vertical so I don't forget that. It's at x equals zero. This should have been y. Good Lord, losing my marbles. Okay, so I can plot these two points just like we did. And we know that in general, an X, a logarithmic um, function goes up steeply and then levels off. And so if I graph these two points, up one over zero, over one, up zero, good grief, and over almost three and up one, it would look something like this as the general shape of an exponential function. I'm not very good at drawing these, um, but you can kind of see what it looks like. The domain is bounded by my vertical asymptote, so it never actually touches zero, but it can go in a positive direction forever. The range goes from negative infinity to infinity, and sometimes you write this as all real numbers, or um, sometimes we see this one written as x is greater than zero. You choose. And finally down here, I just put this, um, this is just the general rules for transformations that changed because we have the natural log or because we have e to the base, um, e to the x power. We still have a vert uh, vertical stretch or compression. If A is between 0 and 1, a reflection over the x-axis, we have a horizontal transformation that changes the x values, and we can have vertical transformations that change your y values. Let's see what graphing a couple of these might look like. All right, if we look at example one, one of the first things I like to do um, is to identify what the parent function is. And in this case, my parent function is going to be a natural log. So I'm going to write that here. Um, and the reason I do that is because that helps me find those important points. And we just identified on the, in the what the important points are for the bait for the parent function of the natural log. And to refresh our memory real quick, that was one zero. And it was 2.72, which is that estimate for the value of E, 1. And now we're going to see what transformations do we have in this function. Well, I remember that I have to use um, Harry Styles, Rocks, Phoenix. So I'm going to look for horizontal transformations first. And I notice there's nothing being added explicitly to the X value. So I'm going to say that there are no horizontal transformations. That's helpful if I am identifying my asymptote, and we'll get to that one. The next thing I look at is um, stretches or compressions. In this case, there is a stretch. I know that because this number is larger than one. It is not being applied directly to the x value, so it is a vertical stretch. So I'm going to go ahead and put that here. It's a vertical stretch by two, and what that does, it's vertical is my x values. I'm sorry, my y values. So I'm going to multiply all my y values by 2. 0 times 2 is 0. 1 times 2, 2. That's pretty easy. And my x values are not going to change because this is a vertical transformation. So now after I've applied my first translation, transformation, this is my new table. If I didn't have any more transformations, I would be done and I could graph this, but I notice I have to keep going. There are no reflections, and I can tell that because there is no negative value here in front. My A value is not negative. 
So there are none of those. And then lastly, I'm going to look and notice that there is a vertical translation and it's negative. So this is going to be a vertical translation down three. And what that's going to do, again, because it's vertical, it's changing my y values. So I'm going to take my y values and I'm going to subtract three from them. When I do that, I am zero minus three is negative three, two minus three, negative one. Again, my x values do not change because it was a vertical transformation. And now I'm done. I have identified the key points and their transformative place on my graph. Because there was no horizontal translation, I know that my vertical asymptote is still at x equals zero. It's going to bound my domain. So I like putting those in there while I'm thinking about it. And then I'm going to graph my points over one and down negative three. Ooh, look at me, I can go. Um, over almost three, down negative one. And again, it keeps essentially that shape that we come to expect from log functions. And there we have it. The last thing I'm asked to do is to identify the domain and range. Well, I get close to my horizontal asymptote, never touch crossing it, but I can get um, larger forever. So I'm going to go towards a positive infinity. For my range, these are the easiest thing in the world, negative infinity to positive infinity. And there we have it. We've done a transformation of the natural log function. Let's try another one. This time we're going to look at example three. I'm going to show example three, which is a natural base function. So first thing I do is identify my parent function, e to the x. Again, that's helpful because I can then look at my notes and find what my key points are. e to the zero power is just one. Any of the zero power is one. e to the first power is going to be that really funky number, 2.72. So those are my important parent functions. And now I look to see what transformations have happened to this function. First thing I notice is I look at my horizontal trans translations and there is a, tr a horizontal component here. I can identify it as being directly subtracted from the x value. It's horizontal. And because we know insiders lie, uh, then I know that this is gonna go to the right too. And when I look at this, what does that, and I ask myself, what is that for my table? I remember that horizontal transformations change my x value. So my x value in this case is going to have um, two added to all of the x values. So in zero plus two gives me two, one plus two is three. And those are my new x values. My y values do not change because it's a horizontal translation. Next, I look to see if there's any stretch or compression, and there is not. There is no reflection. The A value is actually one, so there is no reflection. And then lastly, I'm gonna look for a vertical transformation up or down. And in this case, I'm going on one. It's vertical, so it's gonna change my Y values. So here I'm gonna subtract one, from my y values, and I end up with zero. One minus one, zero. 2.72 minus one is 1.72. And in this case, my x values do not change. They are still two and three. Before I can start graphing, I need to figure out what my horizontal, or my ver horizontal asymptote, vertical asymptote is. This says horizontal. It should say vertical. That true? No, this is right. Sorry. It is a horizontal asymptote. Lost my mind for a minute. And I do not look at my horizontal translation. I actually look at my vertical translation. So my graph is down one. My horizontal asymptote is going to be at y, is y equals good grief, Palmer, negative one. And so I'm going to just sketch that in because that is the line that my graph is going to get close to, but is actually never going to cross. Okay, 
So graphing my two points, um, I go over two, up zero. I go over three and I go up almost two. And then I sketch in what I know an exponential function can typically look like. I know it gets close to my horizontal asymptote without actually crossing. And that's going to be the general shape of this function. And then lastly, I notice that my domain, it can go to negative infinity forever. It goes up to positive infinity forever. My range, however, is bound by my horizontal asymptote. My graph will never go below negative one, but can go up forever. And we've already identified that your math teacher is a spaz and that our horizontal asymptote is at y equals negative one. So guys, that's how we graph functions. Let's see if we can just identify naked transformations. In example five, we're just gonna, we are just asked to identify transformations, domain range, and a vertical asymptote. This should go fairly quickly. The first thing I do is I look for any horizontal transformations that might have happened. In this case, I um, am subtracting 11 from the x value, which has the effect of going to the right by 11 units. I'm doing a natural log function. So you know, my natural log functions have vertical asymptotes, and that is determined by my horizontal transformation. So I'm going to go ahead and say that my vertical asymptote is at 11. The next thing I look for are any stretches or compressions. And there is a stretch here. It's a stretch by nine. It's not being applied directly to the x. It's on the outside of the function, so it's vertical. It's important to state that. Vertical stretch. It's a stretch because the number is greater than one. Vertical stretch by nine. The next thing I look for are any reflections. That's when my a value is negative. In this case, it is a reflection over the x-axis. And then last, I look for any vertical transformations. And there is none over here. Nothing is being added or subtracted from my um, y value in this function. So I have no vertical translations. When looking at my domain, I need to remember that I am bound by my vertical asymptote. So in this case, 11 is going to be the line that I approach but never cross. But I can get larger forever. My range, I can approach negative infinity and all the way up to positive infinity, as all logarithmic functions are able to do. And that's the, that's, that's, those are the transformations that have been applied in example five. I'm going to do one last example with you. I want to look at example eight because it's a little bit odd. The first thing I notice, it's the, it's the natural base function, e to the x power. I'm just going to go through and identify my trans transformations. The first one is a horizontal transformation, and there is one. In this case, it is subtracting 9 from the x value, which has the effect of moving my graph to the right 9 units. I again look for a stretch or compression. There is a stretch in this case by 7. I again have a reflection. And that's the reason I wanted to do this example. This reflection, because it's a um, exponential function, has some interesting effects. If you think about an exponential function, it normally goes like this. But because I'm reflecting it across the x-axis, it's now going to look something like this. And I wanted to talk about that because that will change um, our domain and range a little. So in this case, it is a vertical reflection over the x-axis. And then the last thing I look for are any sort of vertical translations. And in this case, there is. And this is a vertical translation up 15. The 15 is going to be uh, important to remember when identifying my range. But in this case, the 15 is not the lower bound of my graph because my graph has been flipped. 15 is now the upper bound for my graph. 
my graph will never go higher than 15, but it can go below forever. So that's the reason I wanted to do this example. My domain for exponential functions is infin negative infinity to infinity. And we've already said that my horizontal asymptote is defined by that vertical translation. And so that's gonna be at y equals 15. But this is the part I really wanted you to see. Because we are reflecting an exponential function, my range statement is flipped from what it would be without that reflection. Lastly, folks, we have our transformation rules here if you need to review them or see what they would look like with a natural log or a natural base function. That's it for today. Thanks.